Did you wake up this morning with your mind stayed on Jesus? Hallelujah. I'm telling you, there is something about assembling with the saints of God. This morning when I woke up, I had pain in my neck. I didn't want to be bothered. I didn't want to get up. I didn't want to come to church. I didn't want to leave praise and worship. I didn't want to do anything but lay there in misery. And this morning when I got here, I started seeing everybody's smiling face. I saw uh, Julie and her kids. The kids were just so sweet. They had such beautiful smiles on their faces. My kids were talking to me before church started, and I just started feeling better and better and better. And I said, glory to God. Had I just stayed at home and sat there, I wouldn't feel like this. But I came out to be with the saints of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yeah, my neck still hurts. However, I know that God is a healer. Glory to God. And I know that assembling with the saints and smiling and helping other people to feel good as well is what he wants me to do. Glory to God. So I say thank you. I say hallelujah. I say praise the name of Jesus. Help me praise him. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, victory is mine. I don't know about y'all, but I already know victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, honey, you get on behind because victory today is mine. Glory to God. Victory is mine. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I know y'all know this one because it's old. Sing it with me. Victory is mine.
great is our God. How great is our God. How great, how great is our God. He has a name above all names. Hallelujah. And he is so worthy of all the praise. How great, how great is our God. Glory. Hallelujah. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, I'll sing how great, how great is our God, again, how great is our God, how great.
thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord. We magnify you. We lift up holy hands in this your sanctuary. We say thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We magnify your name in this place, Father God. For you're worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. Lord, you're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we honor your name today. Your name, your name, your name, your name, Lord. Your name, your name. Not, not our name, but your name, Lord. Your name is worthy to be praised. That's, that's it. I'm just looking for the praises of his people. If you know that you are his people, can you give him the praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let all those that recognize who God is signify by praising his holy name. Amen. Let the house say amen. Come on. Let, let, when we agree on everything, we finish that up with amen. So, so if anybody knows that God is good, can you say? If you know that God is a healer, can you say? If you know that God is a deliverer, can you say? Let the redeem of the Lord say so. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo. We thank God. We thank God for who he is. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. It is so good to see everybody in the house today. I, I am I'm so pleased because God is truly doing wonderful things, amen, in this house. I um, am, today we were supposed to have a, a special guest uh, to come and give his testimony, but I'm going to say that until next week they had to do, make a, a run to Kansas City, and so um, we're going to hold that to next week, amen? amen? Amen, but uh, I do have a testimony of two young people who we prayed for, and that God has answered their prayers, and you know, it's one thing to pray for someone, but it's another thing to see prayers being answered, amen? amen. Is there anybody that's a witness of a prayer being answered? Amen. I, I, I know. I, I ain't the only one this morning. Amen. I'm in a house full of folks that had prayers answered after prayer after prayer. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I'm smiling. Because I remember the person that stayed up all night praying for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Praying for me. Praying for me. There is a word from God today, and I'm asking those of you who have your Bibles to turn to the gospel according to Matthew, the 15th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. And those of you who do not have your Bibles, we do have the words on the screen for you. Amen. Amen. When you get there, you can let me know that we're there. Oh, amen. Amen. Thank God for our technology department. Boy, they are on it. Amen. Let's read the text of the word together. 
One, two, ready, read. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. For a few minutes that is ours to share, I just want to talk about a one-word subject, crumbs, 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 crumbs. Amen, because sometimes we got to learn how to do to survive on nothing but crumbs. Any, any crumb survivors in the house today? Amen. Amen. Anybody ever had a wish sandwich in the house? You, you don't know what a wish sandwich is, do you? A wish sandwich is when you take two pieces of bread and some mayo and you wish you had some meat to go in between it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, let me, let me get some for the college students in here. Um, anybody ever had to survive off some Roman noodles? Amen. My, my favorite flavor, chicken Roman noodles. Amen. Anybody ever? Ooh, we, we, know, we know about chicken Roman noodles. Amen. You stick it in the microwave and instantly you got a whole meal. Amen. Amen. But when we study the 15th chapter of Matthew, we're going to find several items and several themes that are found in this particular text. What we learn is, is that the people are far more often attached to the traditions than the commandments uh, and the commandments of human beings than they are to the law of God. Let me say that again so I don't say it mis uh, get it misconstrued. People were more accustomed to the traditions of men than they were to the law of God. When you study that 15th chapter of Matthew, you also see that people are strongly disposed to explain away the law. Watch this. Because sometimes the law of God is too strict for them to follow. So what do we do? We water it down and we change the law of God so it fits us instead of us fitting the law of God. See, the problem that some of us have is we, we don't read our Bibles, we read at our Bibles, and we want the Bible to fit us instead of us fitting the Bible. We want God's law to fit us, and so we really want to customize God and change God and rearrange God and say, God, this really don't fit me. Thou should not care. Well, that's really not my nature. If somebody crossed me the wrong way, I might pull out a switchblade. I might pull out a, uh, no, no, none of y'all would do that. But anyway, but, but we see, we see what's taking place here in the text. And, and people are perplexed even on this one because when you look at Mark's version of the story, um, it is written in Mark 7, he says that Jesus called a crowd to him and said, watch this, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. This is, Brother Craig, theologically deep. Hermeneutically, if you wanted to extract this and, and, and divide this into its historical content and, and everything else, it kind of goes kind of against what a lot that the Bible has said about good food like pork chops. Amen? Anybody that eat pork chops in the house, all right? Amen, amen. Anybody going to invite me over to your house for pork chops? Amen. <laughs> I like mine fried. <laughs> if y'all don't like pork chops, what about sausage? Amen. We had coffee and donuts, but man, ain't nothing like a good old sausage sandwich with your homemade biscuits and, and some good old country syrup and sop it up. Ooh, I'm starting to get a lot of y'all hungry. Let me, let me stop talking about food this morning. Amen. Well, what about, what, what, what are we saying? And I always wanted to argue this text, Brother Oakley, for the purpose in reference to just food. But I studied this morning, and, and, and when I, as I was studying this particular text, it's bigger than food. Watch this. It's about what comes out 
other person that makes a person unclean. I'm not going to deal with the biological aspect of this because one of the theologians told me one day, he said, if you must eat, you also must excrete. Now, those of y'all who know the definition of that word understand what I just said. But I'm not dealing with that area. I'm dealing with what comes out of your mouth. Ooh. If you walk down to the 20th verse of that same chapter, what comes out of a person's mouth makes him unclean. Wait a minute, wait a minute before y'all get there. Let me, let me, let me help y'all understand this. Because, see, the text says, for within, out a man's heart. Golly. Mark is deep on this. Cause, and and y'all going to get this in the next 60 seconds. Because all forms of evil thoughts come from within a person. This is so deep, but it's going to be so simple. It comes from within a person. It's so, and therefore, it, it's, it's what's in you. You can't no longer say, the devil made me do it. The devil only activates what's in you. Inside of a man, inside of a woman, is the propensity to do, to do evil. If a person is an adulteress, watch this, it was inside of them. If a person is a murderer, it was inside of them. If a person is a liar, a thief, and a cheat, and if you read the entire text, it lists all those sins in there. And what does it say? Jesus said it's already inside of you. That's why we need to pray that prayer, Lord, cleanse me. Remove the transgressions that are inside of me because something inside of me makes me do evil. Something inside of me makes me open up my mouth and say the things that I say. I can't blame somebody else for driving down the road and they cut me off and I saw it to call them everything but a child of God. Yeah, I seen y'all. I seen y'all. I'm, I'm praying for me. I'm praying for me. I don't know about you. You got to pray for you. Amen. But when we, when we cuss somebody out, understand it, it was inside of you. When we do evil to folks, it's inside of you. When people do evil to you, even though you try to date them and try to make that person feel like he was the best thing since sliced bread, and you wonder why he's trying to go upside, it was inside. You just didn't see it. Or you saw it and tried to ignore it. That's a deep amen on that one. It's not, it's not, and understand this, it's not, and I'm teaching today. I'm going to teach a lot today. It's not what you're going through that keeps you from worshiping God. It's what's in you that keeps you from worshiping God. It's not about what's on the outside. It's what's going on on the inside. I don't care what's going on on the outside of your life. It's what's going on on the inside. If you can control what's going on the inside of you, you can control what's coming out of you. What, what, what does that, that saying say? You are what you eat. If all you eat is garbage, you are what you eat. If you stay up all night long watching those particular magazines and TV shows that are very provocative, then you are. What goes in, you control. If you control what goes into you, you will control what comes. If you have garbage that comes always into your life and you wonder why you get angry so quick, you wonder why you cuss so many folks out, it's because what's around you, you are allowing to go inside of you. And once it's inside of you, it's automatically going to come out of you. And you can't control when it comes out. The reason why some of you can't even open your mouths is not based on what's going on on the outside. That's the problem. It's what's going on on the inside. Watch this. The Bible says, create in me a clean what? And renew the right spirit in where? This is the dealing with God that deals with the, on the inside of you. And the Bible says, we should worship the Lord at all time and his presence should what? Continually be in our where? 
That controls what's on the inside coming out of you. The Bible says, let everything that has what? Praise ye the Lord. It's not what's in you uh, that, that, that's difficult to come out. Watch this. It's not about what's going around on outside of you that makes it difficult, but it's what's on the inside. And if you can't find the spirit of God within you, then what comes out of you is not going to be praise, but it's going to be complaints. Mm. Let me tie this in because everybody's wondering how does this tie this into crumbs and the story. So let, let me make a, a hermeneutical, allegorical analysis of the text, and you'll allow me to contextualize the text, which means to bring it the text into modern day terminology. What the woman has is she has everything going against her. Watch this. She's looking for Jesus, and Jesus doesn't want to be found. They said that Jesus goes into a hidden house where nobody's supposed to know where Jesus is. The Bible says that he was intentionally trying to remain unseen. And, and what do you do when it seems like you can't find Jesus wherever you're looking for him at? Second thing is she's a female. She has a daughter who's demon-possessed. But she knows that Nobody else has been able to save her child, but Jesus can. She's a female. She's a Gentile. Canaanite. Seraphicia is her claim to fame. She comes from the mountains of Seraphicia. She comes down Seraphicia mountains, and she finds Jesus at the coastal shore of Titus. And, and, and when she finds him, everybody knows that she's a Gentile. Well, the Gentile, that is the most hated race of the Jews. People of Jewish nature call them dogs. Any dogs in the house just go bow wow. Y'all missed that. She's a Gentile. She's the most hated race. She knew that, that, that they would not even allow her to come to Jesus. She had, she's a woman. She's, she's, she's a Gentile. She's a Seraphician woman. She probably tried everybody else. She probably went to everybody else. And, and watch this. The Gentiles are still paganistic. They're not supposed to believe in Jesus. And so when you see this, do you see what's, what's happening? When you see what's taking place in, in her life, you can understand why the outside influences are making a difference in her life. But watch this. She makes a conscious decision after being told no, that she's still going to pursue Jesus even after being denied access to Jesus. And watch this. Jesus tells her this one story, says that it is impossible to receive a miracle because I was not sent here to save you. So she has trouble. Watch this. Because a lot of us are going through the same thing. Let me help you deal with her trouble. First of all, she's the wrong sex. Somebody say wrong sex. She's the wrong color. She's the wrong nationality. She's a Gentile. She ignored the custom of the traditionalist. She said that I'm desperate enough in my under-tested faith that I need Jesus, not every hour, but I need him right now. Let me help y'all see this story so that y'all can understand. The Bible tells this story clearly. The woman who was given no name, but she's important. Y'all going to get this in a second. Nobody knows her by her name, but they know her by her condition and her position. She's a woman. She's a Gentile. She's told where she comes from. She is a Canaanite, which is dog country. And her daughter is cruelly afflicted by an evil spirit. She reaches around, uh, beyond her paganistic views of the Messiah and she looks beyond her nationality she looks beyond her sexuality she looks beyond her situation and she sees the Savior don't miss this she would think and anybody else would think that this story is going to be a short quick miracle testimony and so she walks up to Jesus and she says mercy master son of David she recognizes him as the Messiah. And watch this. Even though the disciples don't see her that way. Watch this. 
she is chasing Jesus in a secret place. Mm. And she finds the Savior, and she begs Jesus, please heal my daughter. She's pleading. She's begging. She's desperate. She's accurate in her location, accurate in her assumption, accurate in her accusations, actual, accurate in her actualization. She asks the Savior to help her, and Jesus simply ignores her. Hmm. Have you ever prayed unto God and it seems like God is ignoring what you're asking for? You prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and pleaded to God and bargained with God and tried to negotiate with God and it seems like God is not hearing you? Nobody wants to be a crumb. Y'all going to get this. The disciples come and tell Jesus, just give her what she's asking for and get rid of her because all that worshiping noise she's doing is getting on my nerves. Y'all going to get this in a second. The house is quiet the way it's supposed to be, Jesus. And here she comes calling you Master, Messiah, and all that. Just give her what she needs so she can get up out of here. That, 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 that sounds like the church today. Because the problem for non-growing churches is we still got apostles in the church still telling folks who are desperately seeking Jesus to be silent in the church because the folks who are looking for Jesus are making too much noise in the church, but the evil inside of you is what's keeping a lot of folks from praising God. I just got finished explaining to you is what's inside of you that causes you to say what you're going to say and to do what you're going to do, and those folks who don't like folks making noise in a quiet place need to get up out of the church because the church is the place where you're supposed to make a joyful noise. I keep telling you that what comes inside of you affects what goes out of you. And so if you're hearing joyful noise, then what should come out of you is joyful noise. If you're hearing praise coming out the people's mouth, then that should be what's coming out of you. But if you're spending too much time listening to folks and it's getting on your nerves because the folks in the house are praising God and seeking out the Jesus, it's what's already on the inside of you. And that means that whatever they're saying, you ain't listening. Whatever they're doing, you ain't noticing. Whatever Whatever's going on in their life, you ain't watching because it's the what praises that goes on the outside that affects what comes on the inside. And if you can't say anything, it's because you're sitting next to a praiser, but you don't know how to act. You don't know how to respond. It's not what's going on the outside that's keeping you from praising. It's what's wrong on the inside that's keeping you from praising. It's not the folks around you that's lifting up praises because they are desperately seeking Jesus because they need something from him. It's you. Look at this woman. She's got the wrong nationality. She's got the wrong sexuality. She's in the wrong locality. She's got the wrong formality. And now the disciples are saying, Jesus, just give her what she needs so she can leave us alone. Jesus is ignoring her. And watch this. Jesus tells his disciples, his own boys, who are just now pleading with Jesus, heal this woman so she can get up out of here. Watch what Jesus says to them. No. She recognizes the deity of Jesus. She recognizes her reality. She pleads to his majesty. She even asked the disciples for leniency and clemency. And Jesus says to everybody, no, watch how he responds. He says, I got my own hands full dealing with church folks. Okay. I got my own hands dealing with church folks. There may be somebody here today that feels just like this woman. Watch this. People know your past. They know where you are from. They know what you've been through. They're praying with you and nothing is happening, but the person next to you, watch this, that comes to church every week, seem like they ain't never got nothing going on, and they always quiet are the ones that seem like they always getting blessed. So how do you handle 
when you know what you need and the only person who can supply your needs seems like nothing is happening. He's not responding to you. And even when you get folks to pray for you and pray with you, seems like Jesus ain't doing nothing at all. Somebody look at your name and say, it's no fun being a crumb. <laughs> Y'all will get that in a minute. See, this woman has problems with being in troubles that come from being a crumb now. She moves from her troubles and sees the text shift, and she comes up with this crumb faith. Hmm. She's identified by the disciples. She's ignored. She's denied by Jesus. And you would expect her to get angry and leave. And what's happening, which is what happens in church today, people come and we identify who they are. We ignore what they need. We deny them in serving them and not serving them. And we expect them to leave. But watch what the woman does. She goes to get on her knees. Now imagine this. She's a former paganistic person. She's from Canaan, a Gentile nation who who knows not the Lord. But she falls on her knees and watch this. She begins, as the text says, she begins to worship him. She's first denied for being who she is. She's denied because of who she is. She's denied because what sex she is. She's denied because what nationality she is. And she has been denied by Jesus not once but twice. She should leave his presence angry because Jesus came for the Jews and nobody else. But watch what she does. She falls on her knees and she prays to God. She prays to the Savior, and she begins to worship him, saying, Lord, help me. I know I'm not worthy, but Lord, help me. I I, I know I've never called on you before, but Lord, help me. I know I'm a Gentile, but Lord, help me. I know I'm a female and ain't supposed to be in for your presence because the traditions of of the men say I shouldn't be so, but Lord, help me. I know I'm not what you expect, Father God. I know who you are, Messiah. I know that you are the son of David, but I'm desperate enough in who I am in what I am to come to you because I know that you are the only one who can solve my problem and and I'm looking at this woman right now and I can give you a tweet Facebook moment right now watch this when God says no it doesn't always mean that his final answer is no but he's really trying to test and stretch your faith let me help you by saying that again if God says no it may not really mean that's his final answer but sometimes God has to stretch and test your faith in other words he needs to see how bad you really they want it. If every no was the final answer, some of y'all wouldn't be in church today. When sickness came and, and the doctor said no and God said no, but you still got over that sickness, it's because he wanted to see how bad you wanted your body healed. And when the death was knocking at your door and death was told no, it's because God still said yes and he wanted you to live and tell the story. When the foreclosures were coming and they were going to repossess your house and your car, God told them no and the foreclosure got stopped. When you were uh, uh, dealing with that crazy person, and you called him a boyfriend, and God said, no, he ain't your friend, and he took that man out of your life, and now you see that man with somebody else, and she dealing with the craziness that you should have been dealing with. When God said no sometime, his no is for a reason. We got to learn how to rejoice in the no's in life. Sometimes it was a no that kept you alive. Sometimes it was a no that kept sickness away from you. It was a no that kept death from coming to you. It was a no that kept folks that should have hurt you, that were designed and purpose to hurt you, to keep them away from you. God said no. We can rejoice on the yes, but how many in the house today can rejoice when God said no? I'm glad God said no. God said no, and I stopped doing what I was doing. God I said no and I learned how to get myself together and start following Christ when God says no Mm. 
when God says no. So, 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 so understand this. There's a revelation in being a crumb. It's a revelation. It's a revelation in being a crumb. Because if you understand this story, the main character of the story is the woman who is undeserving of being recognized because of who she is. She's undeserving of Jesus' attention because he ignored her, as the Bible said. She's undeserving of assistance because even after the disciples asked Jesus to help, he still said no. She's undeserving of a blessing uh, because of, not because, only because of who she is and because of what she is, but watch this, it's from where she is from. And, and watch this, this woman continues to worship him. She continues to beg. She continues to plead. She continues to pray unto him. And she got down to her lowest piece of, of humility. She got on her knees and bowed her head and said, Lord, help me. And then watch how Jesus responds. He said, why should I take the bread, Jesus being the bread of life, why should I take the blessing from those who I came specifically for? The question Jesus asked this unnamed woman is, why? I'm teaching this. Jesus has already made up in his mind, but the next thing that happens is one of the greatest revelations in the text, for this revelation changes the mind of Jesus. Watch what happens. The woman, as the Bible says, she begins to worship Jesus at his feet. The Greek meaning of this word says that she turned her affections towards Jesus. Hmm. Okay. He said, no. She said, please. He said, no. The disciples said, please. He said, no. She worshiped him. And how does he respond to her worship? He questions her. This is watch what happens. Even after being told no, even after being ignored from Jesus, even after being turned away from Jesus, the woman still continues to worship Jesus. Oh God. Y'all gonna y'all gonna miss this. I, I gotta help you see it. He was testing her faith. Because this was bigger than just a woman. I'm going to help y'all see this. If you've ever gone through turmoil and pain in your life, and it keeps coming day after day after day, sometimes God doesn't want you just to say, Lord, have mercy. He's trying to get your attention to worship him. If you having heartaches and headaches and seem like folks getting on your everlasting nerve and you ain't got but one nerve left and it seems like somebody just got on that nerve, sometimes God is wanting you to just worship him. If you ever gone through trials and tribulations and it seems like trouble is coming on every hand is sometimes that God is simply trying to get you to worship him. If, if, if somebody here today thought that that situation that you were in was supposed to be the death of you, but you still survived it, and you're wondering, what do I do next? Simply said, God is trying to get you to worship him. Mm. If there's anybody that, that's willing to stop worrying about the silent minority sitting next to you because everybody ain't going to respond to this and you're not worried about who talks about you because you're going to shout to this and you don't worry about who gets mad at you because you're going to stand up and give God the glory from this. But if you realize that instead of giving your complaints to God and you give your praise to God, it's sometimes how you react to trouble determines how you're going to come out of trouble. And if you're willing to let somebody know that I know how to handle 
handle trouble. And when trouble comes, I know how to respond. Maybe you can help somebody because somebody in here today don't know how to worship God because when trouble comes, tears start falling down their eyes. You need to be worshiping. When trouble comes, you start to get angry at somebody instead of worshiping God. When trouble comes, you start acting like all hell is about to break loose and God is just trying to get your attention because he wants you to worship him. And, and if there's somebody that's just like this woman, and watch this, she says that I refuse to take no as an answer. I refuse to have no as my only option because I am determined that as the mother of my child that I'm praying for, that I'm seeking you for, I'll take whatever you're going to take. I'll take whatever you're going to give me. I don't care if you get angry with me. I'm still going to praise them. I don't care if you kick me out of my church. I'm still going to praise them. I don't care if you get mad. I don't care if you start ain't calling me out of my name. I'm still going to praise them. And watch this. Jesus does something that was even more amazing. He says that even, watch this. Mm, he says, is it right for me to take the bread of life from the people who deserve it and give it to a dog? She's a female. She's a Gentile. She is a, a Phoenician woman. And then watch this. He says, you are a dog. My last point, because y'all, 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 y'all going to get this. She says, it's okay. I'm going to let that marinate. Call me, whatever you want to call me. And you're right, but I still need you. Oh, God. Woo! You're a liar. You're an adulteress. You're a cheater. You're a murderer, but you still need him. Woo! He calls her the lowest thing he could call her is a dog. And he asks us, he says, should I take away from the children who, according to Jewish custom, was the lowest form? Because Jesus said, unless you become like a child. That's how you become greatest. And so he, he said the lowest will become the greatest. Watch this. He said, we consider the children low, but what's lower than the child is a dog. Mm. Golly. A dog doesn't deserve anything. And you, in your sinful nature, Gentiles, Canaanites, Seraphicians, females, don't deserve. But how many of you are in here today that are desperate enough? that you know what you need and you know who you need it from and that you ain't worried about what they say. Even if you're told no, I'm not going to take no as an answer, Lord. I know what you can do and I know what you're capable of doing. Even though I'd never worship you, even though I'd never give you the praise, even though I'd never open up my mouth, even though I'd never tried to do whatever I could do, Lord, I know right now that I'm desperate enough that I need to have a word from you. I need for you to heal my daughter. I need you, Lord. You just don't understand how desperate I am and if there's anybody that's just that desperate because what you need from God is going to depend on how desperately you need it from God y'all missed that what you need for him right now and if I ask anybody is there anybody in here that needs something from God today let me return the question back to you how desperate do you need it uh, I can tell on your face that some of y'all need something from God today so I'm gonna ask that question again is there anybody in here that needs something from God today well then let me ask you a question how desperate are 
are you to get it? Are you willing to take whatever it takes? Are you willing to humble yourself? Are you willing to get down on your knees and pray to God and say, Lord, I will worship you even though you tell me no. I will worship you even though you call me a dog. I will worship you even though you deny me. I will worship you because I need something from you today. And can I tell you what this woman understood even though she ain't never read the Bible? She understood that the prayers of the righteous still avail of much. That's a promise for me and that's a promise from you. And what she understood is that what God has for me is for me. But she also understands this, watch this, that the Lord will make your enemies your footstool. Somebody gonna get this in a minute. And she understand that even in uh, the midst of her situation that the God promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. That's a promise for me and that's a promise for you. And he also said that no weapon formed against us shall ever prosper. But what I liked about this and what I understand is watch this. Jesus challenges her faith one more time when he calls her a dog. But watch this. Most of you would have left the church whenever something got denied to you. Some of you would have hung around but then you would have left the church when the, when the disciples prayed and nothing happened. But the most important thing is some of you wouldn't have left the church when you got called a dog but, but because you didn't leave the church and you still here right now and you understand what I'm talking about let me give you the revelation that's found in the word crumb the woman said that I can survive off of the crumbs Whew. revelation time is difficult I can survive off of the crumbs let me help y'all understand that one She's saying that I can live off the crumbs. Let me help y'all see this. Here's a table. And Jesus said, should I take the bread from the table? And if someone was to take bread, and then I had toast this morning. Amen. And, and my wife made me some, some toast this morning. And, and this illustration, baby, you gave to me when you gave me that toast this morning. I tried to, as neatly as I possibly could, eat the toast. And I was being greedy. And I didn't want none of the crumbs to go anywhere. Well, I happened to have on a black shirt this morning, black T-shirt. And, and, and as I was eating my bread... I noticed that on my shirt was the crumbs. From eating this toast this morning, I ate my toast. It was hot buttered toast. She didn't put no cinnamon on it this morning, but that's all right. It was hot buttered toast, and from the bread, it fell on my shoulder. So I really didn't want that, so I brushed it off. Now, when I brushed it off, my wife going to get mad at me because it landed on the floor. So now I got crumbs on the floor underneath the table. If we had a dog, that's what the dog would be. Underneath the table. Crumbs that I didn't want. Blessings that I didn't want. Healing that I didn't want. Deliverance that I didn't want. Changing my life that I didn't want. I brushed it off. It landed on the floor. I didn't need it because I already had a big enough piece for myself. Y'all going to get this in a minute. I had everything that I needed. When I left, I was full because what I had was enough for me. But watch this. She said, I don't need the big piece. I need what fell up under the table, and I can survive off what comes off a table. I can survive what's on the floor. I don't need the big piece. I just need a little piece. And can I help somebody out this morning? Is she, there was enough in that one little crumb that she needed. That's all she needed. And if she had it, all she could do is eat of it. Y'all about to laugh on me in a second because my little man back here, he's back there pointing right back at me. And he's telling me, Pastor, you preaching that this morning. I understand. And thank you, Cameron. I appreciate your amen. But you got to understand, when the crumb comes off the table, when it comes off of me, that's enough for somebody else to have and live off of them. I can live off the crumb. I can survive off the crumb. I can thrive off the crumb. I can be healed off the crumb. I can be delivered off the crumb. 
I need somebody that loves that's a crumb snatcher in the house today. Is there anybody that's a crumb snatcher? A crumb snatcher is somebody that would take the leftovers and make a meal off the leftovers. I ain't got to have what comes from the table. Just give me what's left over. I don't have to have the big piece. Just give me what's left over. Now watch this. Watch this. Up until this point, Jesus had only mentioned twice that the faith of a non-Jew was significant enough to change his mind. The Roman centurion soldier who came up to him. And now the Seraphician woman. But watch what happens from this moment on because of the faith and the righteousness of this woman who was rejected denied now Jesus changes and shifts his ministry from dealing just with the Jews and now it's with the Gentiles figure that one out and so now he's expounded his ministry to include folks like me and like you that's what he did. He expanded his ministry so much so that the whole world falls under his ministry now. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Whoa. From that point on, everything, when he fed 5,000 Jews, he fed 4,000 Gentiles. Are y'all seeing this now? And because of the faith of the Seraphician woman to survive off the crumbs. Now ministry goes throughout the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't we celebrate God? Amen. Amen. We thank God for this Seraphician woman. Amen. And, and in reality, there are some of us who feel just like this woman. You know, the Bible never mentions...